I hope you're all doing well today. It's an honor to be here with you. My name is Ryan Jones. I lead the Power App Scale team at Microsoft, and what we focus on all day is how do we help our largest customers operate every app within their organization. From small to large, we want to help you run them all. Or maybe I should say from large to small, let's run them all. And so I want to start off with a story. And that story starts with puppies, OK? Um, and the thing is, power apps are a lot like puppies in that they're intelligent, <laughs> even if they don't have a co-pilot. They're beautiful. This is my Brunhilde giant schnauzer with modern design. They're fast, especially if there's a squirrel involved. And they're mobile as they chase said squirrel, OK? And so the thing is, one puppy is awesome. Five puppies, they start to be a bit of a handful. 50 puppies, oh dear. And 500 puppies tends to be a bit of a nightmare. Now, don't look too closely. This is dolly generated. So um, <laughs> if you look closely at the puppies, you'll really, really see. Um, that, but don't, uh, you know, don't, don't look away. Now, here's the thing. If we think about puppies, we know them by name. We care for them. We know each and every one of them. But the reality is, as your organizations are building more and more applications, you don't have the ability to know and understand each and every app and each and every environment. And so we think a lot about how do we make our apps a lot more like sheep, right? We still care for them. They're still warm and cuddly. We still shepherd them, if you will. However, we manage them as a herd. We manage them as a flock, right? Um, you may have heard this is kind of like in other forums, if you've worked in infra before, cattle and pets. We like sheep and puppies a little bit better because they're more cuddly. But this is really, really how we think about the world. And so the thing is, if we look at the puppy world versus the sheep world, we look at apps that are built by hand. But of course, as we've talked about all event, you're going to have more apps than ever created by co-pilots. We think about how today these apps get placed within a single environment versus being provisioned into a large number of personal environments. We think about a large number of ad hoc operations, whether we're talking about security, licensing, or other tasks that you complete on a regular basis. And then we also think a lot about a shift between largely reactive management and governance to proactive governance. And the thing is, as we make this transition from puppies to sheep, the thing is, we want to make sure that the Power Platform provides you with the tools that you need to manage your low-code estate. Whether you're an organization that has 10,000 apps with 10 users each, or if you're the, app, the organization with 10 apps that have 10,000 users each, or more likely, it's a blend of both for you. And so our tools, we aim to help you cross the chasm, where you move from a world where you use power apps and power platform capabilities that are provided to you, uh, seeded through your office um, licenses that you have today, to enterprise mode, where you're harnessing the full power of AI, where you are connecting to a broad set of enterprise data sources, where you are using ALM to move applications between different environments to manage your operational risk, and where you're moving once again from that world of reactive governance to proactive governance. And so our tools aim to provide you with a bridge that help you cross that chasm. Now, I want to provide a brief recap, because over the course of the last several months, we've invested very, very heavily into our managed environments offering. And I want to make sure that we all start from the same foundation of understanding. When we look at managed environments, managed environments aim to provide you with more visibility, more control, and less effort across all of the environments, applications, and workflows within your tenant. And to give you a few examples of what this looks like, more visibility. We provide you with usage insights that appear within the Power Platform Admin Center, as well as a scheduled admin email digest. So once again, at a glance, you can understand how low code is being utilized within your organization. 
more control, where we allow you to define maker onboarding experiences so that first time makers can be presented with critical onboarding content so that you can inform these users about the right training and things that they will need to do so that they build apps well and build apps in line with your expectations more control around sharing limits, because when we look at the risk that an app can create, in many cases, that risk is directly proportional to the number of users that that app has been shared with. And so sharing limits through managed environments provide you with more control over how broadly applications can be shared within your organization. For less effort, we have power platform pipelines, or as I like to say, it's application lifecycle management for those of us who can't spell ALM. I'm one of them. And the goal with power pipelines is how do you quickly and easily take apps that have been built, potentially in personal productivity environments, and move them into production environments so that you can better support and operate them. Now, here's the thing. This is a very small number of many capabilities that we've shipped as a part of our managed, offer managed environments offering over the course of the last 12 months. And so what I would encourage you to do is if you aren't already doing so, in fact, maybe I could get a show of hands. How many of, using ma are, how many of you are using managed environments today? Okay, a number of you. How about this, next time we meet here? Everybody's hand goes up, okay? So with that, you can follow the link on your screen. Um, I encourage you to try managed environments today. And so with that, I wanna now shift and talk about both capabilities that we have that are brand new in the offering, as well as capabilities that are coming soon. And so to do this, we're gonna go on a journey together. Okay, we're going to talk about how we shepherd. Yeah, we're going to keep going with the sheep metaphor. Sorry. Um, we're going to talk about how we shepherd our users from being a new user to being power users and how we start by first establishing a security baseline so that you know that users are building applications safely and in a way that doesn't create risk for your organization. We will then talk about how you're able to enable governed innovation so that your makers are building applications within the guardrails that you define. We'll talk about how to enhance continuous integration so that you can see to it that these apps seamlessly flow from individual to and through organizational use cases. And then finally, we'll talk about how you can trust and verify as well as optimize what's going on within your low-code estate. And so with that, I'd like to hand things over to Zohar to talk a little bit about how you can establish a security baseline within your organization. Thank you, Ryan. All right, let's talk security. The first pillar that we're gonna cover today is uh, how do you create a baseline? We're hard at work to make the PAP platform your uh, favorite place to build applications in your organization for many reasons one of them would be security so instead of having people build shadow IT or other places to put their applications you want everything to move into the PAP platform many of you have experienced that with files so think about five years ago where people had files saved in their laptops C drive or some shared network uh, shared uh, containers where files were kept and all of that over the COVID has moved all to the cloud with OneDrive and SharePoint. The same motion we want to do with applications in your organization and everything should move into the PAP platform because PAP platform is the most secure place to keep everything. And then we're very proud of every investment that we've done over the last year. So I'm not gonna drain this long slide, but there's a lot of security capabilities. First and foremost, PAP platform runs on top of Azure. So we get a lot of things, you get a lot of things for free uh, as part of just running on Azure. Azure Entra as a place to have users and user management. You get um, the Dataverse is stored on top of Azure, so you get encrypted encryption at rest and then encryption in transit. Uh, there's a rich set of capabilities just by running on top of Azure, our platform, uh, that we get. This year, we are proud to announce, and I'll show a few capabilities throughout the uh, demos today, uh, our integration with additional Microsoft-wide security capabilities. Show of hands, how many of you are using Microsoft Sentinel? How many of you are using Microsoft Purview? So we'll talk about the integrations that we've done this year with these two great products to enhance the security and the visibility that you have into everything that is happening on the Power Platform. 
But specifically, I want to talk and demo today two capabilities of things that we are now moving into the Power Platform Admin Center for you to get more visibility and more control over the assets that either uh, the 10 apps for 10,000 people, so your crown jewels of your organization, and you could secure those in Power Platform, or for the citizen development when there's 10,000 apps built for 10, 10 people each. Um, two controls that I'm going to call out, and I need a pledge from all of you in the audience, that when you go back to your office, this is the first thing you're going to do is turn on what we call tenant isolation. <laughs> tenant isolation is a capability to control your business to business interaction. So many of the companies today have multiple national companies or uh, acquisitions or mergers that you've done over the years and you have a set of companies that you do want to interact with from a collaboration on Power Apps. So you build a Power Apps in, in this example, Contoso, and you want your employees in Fabricam to be able to use it and consume it. Uh, especially or specifically connectors like SharePoint and Exchange and OneDrive that use Azure Entra ID. Uh, now you have the capability to control and allow list of what different companies you want to allow them to do automation and apps that call from Contoso to sources in Fabricam because that employee has access to a SharePoint. Um, now you could actually allow the access, but you could prevent them from doing automation if you decide so, or you could uh, allow them to do the automation using the thing I'll demo in a second. The second capability that I want to show is the IP firewall. IP firewall is a new great capability Ryan showed as part of the managed environment. So when you enable managed environment in a specific environment, now you can control what IP ranges are allowed and you could block a set of IP ranges, especially if you have concerns from other geographies and you want to prevent uh, DOS attacks or just uh, bad actor usage of assets, your crown jewels that are sitting in that environment. So with that, let me switch to the demo machine and I'll show you some of those capabilities. These are available to all of you today. <clears throat> switch me to the demo machine. So here I am in the Power Platform Admin Center. I hope many of you have visited the Power Platform Admin Center. And under policies, you would see uh, tenant isolation. It's pretty easy to turn it on. So the first thing I do is I just turn it on. This is all the things you need to do when you go back home. Then now I could also create policies and I could just say, I want either inbound or outbound or both. I'll do both. And I want to say Contoso is a tenant that we work closely with. So I'm going to enable Contoso as one of the tenants that can actually build automation and applications on top of the content that I'm hosting in my tenant. And that's it. I just click Save, and you could create a list of all the different partners that you work with, and those would not be blocked. Uh, everything else would be blocked. The second thing I want to show you is the IP firewall that I described. So this is a management, managed environment capability. The first thing I would show is environments that are enabled as managed environments. And I'm going to the dev environment specifically that I'm logged in with, Ryan. Cunningham's account, so here I click on settings. And in this settings under products, you would see privacy and security. And we've introduced this new capability that allows me to create an IP range that will be the allowed list. Uh, you could create multiple of them and separate them with commas. Another nice thing that I could do is use the service tag, so I could actually uh, allow list a set of services to interact with my uh, Dataverse assets in the environment, even though they, they come from different IPs. And then last thing is I could choose if I want to uh, log only. So first, I'd probably run it as a trial and just see from the logs if things are getting blocked. And eventually, uh, once I say it's not just for auditing reasons, but really block and click Save, then now every IP that is outside of the range uh, would be blocked and not be able to access the assets that I have, the crown jewels that I have in this environment. Pretty cool. All right, switching back to uh, the PowerPoint. If you are interested in learning a lot more about a rich set of capabilities we have around security, these are the links. So the first link talks about the Power Platform security paper that we have out there that describes all the capabilities to secure your assets. And the other two are the things that I just demo, so tenant isolation and IP firewall. And with that, let's switch and talk about the second pillar. So in the second pillar, it is all about you finding the right sweet spot or trade-off between empowering all your makers or employees in your company to build low-code assets with the Copilot that you've seen this week and Dataverse and the rich set of connectors. 
so they could actually digitalize everything they do in the day to day. But at the same time, how do you as IT keep your environment, your digital environment secured and contained and make sure that things are not overshared or overexposed uh, in a way that you would regret? One of the major things that we rely on when you think about uh, enabling that creativity and innovation is what we call um, the environment strategy. We've been talking about environment strategies over the year for Power Platform. And this Ignite, we're actually introducing a new approach to environment strategy. And I need a show of hands. How many of you are using OneDrive? Great. What OneDrive allows you to do is to take all your files and put them in a personal container. Imagine a world where there was no OneDrive. There was one SharePoint-wide, uh, company-wide container. And all the files, 100,000 employees or 5,000 employees, go into that one container. And the nightmare it, uh, makes IT now govern DLP and employees leaving the company and leaving their files behind. Just very hard to manage in one container. That's what OneDrive actually offers. The equivalent of that is the default environment. So the default environment today that all the employees write into one container is just hard to manage. And what we're introducing today is this concept of environment routing. So with environment routing, instead of all the makers going into this one container called the default environment, you switch a flag inside the Power Platform Admin Center, and now you're configuring your makers to go to their individual personal dev environments. And it gives you a lot more control, because now you could uh, set what connectors those developers could use. Uh, Dataverse uh, comes in with a limited set of gigabytes they could already use right there. You could allow them to use Copilot, and then when they're ready, when the asset is ready to be shared more broadly, IT can actually use Application Lifecycle Management, or ALM, to move them to uh, user testing environments and then production environment, and not only do that, but you could use the pipelines that come with managed environment and inject IT checks and balances and certify the applications before they go uh, and get shared broadly. Think about your expense report or any uh, different application that needs to go to the entire company. The, I, you know, to demo that, it's pretty easy, so I'm not even going to switch to my, uh, my browser. You just go to the tenant settings page, uh, you click on environment routing, and you switch that on. And this is the page where you could learn a lot more about it. And it would allow every new maker that comes to the uh, maker portal of uh, Power Apps to then get a provisioned personal environment and work in that environment. And then you can control it. It has auto expiration. So 90 days later, if it's not in use, it just goes away, which is a huge capability from an administration perspective. The second thing I want to show is uh, the new concept of environment group. So another show of hands. How many of you, when you go to the Power Platform Admin Center in the environment page, see more than one environment? Most of you. How many of you keep your hands up if you see more than 10 environments? What about more than 100 environments? Anyone with more than 1,000 environments? All right, I see a few hands. Ryan, you don't count. <laughs> <laughs> so. Now that you've enabled personal environments, you're probably going to see a lot more. So uh, just like Ryan said, when we meet here again next year, I'll probably ask the same question. You all raise your hand, because personal environments are going to probably fill in the page with a lot of personal environments. So for that, we're introducing a new concept called environment groups, very similar to resource groups in Azure. You can now, as IT, create these uh, containers or sets. and Think about how you're going to use it in your organization. You could use it based on organizational structure. So I could create a set for finance and a different set for HR and engineering. Or you could do it based on functionality. So you could say um, new developers, or you could say experienced developers. And the rules that come with that in the, uh, in the page in Power Platform Admin Center that I'm going to demo would allow you to then set different configurations for every environment that exists in that specific uh, set. So with rules, we're starting a private preview now with six rules that are the managed environment configurations. So you could now s start imagining how you're going to use that for uh, different departments or specifically new or ex existing experienced developers. Um, and then if you match that with the environment routing that I just described or opened with, then now you could actually start connect the dots and see the entire journey. So a new maker comes into the maker portal. They get automatically provisioned a new personal environment. That personal environment is now configured based on how you wanted it to be configured. So you could set sharing limits and say that the dev cannot, you know, maybe they could co-author and collaborate with one person, but not 
50%, so you get to control sharing. You could say what the maker onboarding welcome message would be that Ryan showed. So now you could say, you know, new devs, you go to this page to learn more. Experienced devs, you go to a different page to learn more. You could control the checker, so solution checker, what rules you want the checker to actually enforce on that maker before they come to you and ask to move the asset to UAT or production. So there's a lot of flexibility you get from uh, this new feature. And with that, let me switch to the demo machine and I'll show you this in action. So again, here I am in the Power Platform Admin Center and we brought in a preview uh, page called Environment Groups. And I've already pre-created the environment groups for my organization. Here I'm logged in in Woodgroove. And this new environment for this new environment group for developers, I'm gonna select and show you um, how you manipulate the rules. So these are the six rules I talked about and I've decided that I wanna change the sharing settings. I'm gonna set it up for two. You'll see Ryan later come on board and show what the experience would be on the maker side. I could go and say from a weekly digest perspective, I actually wanna see these environments in the report that I get as an administrator on what's active and uh, what's popular. I could create a maker onboarding message. So here I am welcoming the maker. This is uh, the text that they're gonna get. You see when Ryan demos the maker side, how that experience looks like. So welcome to Woodgroove. These are the resources you wanna uh, go use or read before you get started. And then I could go on and on and configure all these rules. At the end of them, what I do is I just click on publish. And now that I've published these rules, I'm gonna show you how this uh, plays a key role for the experience for the uh, end users. So here I am an allowed administrator that I'm allowed to create a new environment and I'm creating a demo environment. Um, and then this is new. So now I could click here and this is the new developer's environment and I'm creating the environment inside the new developer and that's it. Uh, I'm gonna need to select a security group, so let's just create a security group from this one, if I only knew how to type. So this is a security group that I picked, and as this gets created, it gets created with all the configuration that I've set in the environment group. To prove that, I go to the environment group. This is the new group that I created. You could see that there's new one environment in it, and it's the one demo one that I created. That's pretty cool. All right. Last thing I want to show you is how I tie it to environment routing. It's as simple as one click. So here I am and I'm selecting this to be the destination for the makers coming into the portal. I click on environment routing and now environment routing not only has an on off switch which you would see because you're not in a private preview, it actually lets me select what group those uh, makers would go to and then they land in this group and they land with all the configuration and to show that, uh, I've already created Alex's environment and if I go to Alex's environment and look, look at uh, it's managed environment settings, it's all disabled. It's all controlled based on the rule. So uh, in this case, the environment admin cannot change the rule. This is the maker onboarding that I, uh, the message that I introduced and then uh, sharing limits and on and on. Pretty cool. So back to the PowerPoint. If you wanna sign up for the preview, so be an early adapter of ours, this is a way you could subscribe. And then separately, you could just sit and wait and uh, early in 2024, we're gonna release that to uh, all of you. So it's gonna be public. The last thing I wanna show in this pillar is the work that we're doing to simplify assignment of license. Yesterday we had a Q&A session and I was asked a lot of questions about licensing. Uh, as we introduced managed environment, managed environment is designed such that every launch of an app inside managed environment, the user would need uh, Power Platform premium licenses. And it becomes a, a challenge for IT to assign the licenses to the right users. Doing that manually is close to being a nightmare. So what we're introducing is a new capability of making it very easy and productive on the end user, but also simplifying it for uh, the administrator to manage it automatically and you don't need to do anything. The first capability, there's two. The first capability I'm gonna show is how we integrated with the Microsoft 365 uh, policies of licensing. So if you go to uh, the Microsoft 365, not just for Teams, now there's also for Power Apps, an ability to create something called an auto claim policy. So a maker, sorry, an end user going and launching an asset, one of your assets in a managed environment, automatically gets to pull a license from the pool of licenses that you have at the company level without needing an administrator uh, to assign it in real time. 
and then the administrator could monitor the queue and just make sure that there's licenses for all the people that need it. So you could actually create a managed environment for finance if they're the organization that purchased all the licenses and then make sure that every employee in finance that is launch, launching a finance app gets assigned the premium licenses that you have in your queue while preventing engineering or HR or other departments from uh, using the queue. The second thing is for those that are not using the queue and are not part of the auto claim, we're introducing a new concept called uh, or integrating with a concept called request license where the employee launching the app, it's a premium app that sits in an environment that doesn't necessarily is a managed environment, but just has an app with premium requirements. As they launch it, instead of giving, getting this pop up saying access denied, sorry, you don't have a license, or getting this, you can sign up for a trial. Now they can actually interact with the admin and say, I need, an ac I need a license. The request would show up in a queue for the administrator to approve. And the administrator could actually customize the message that the user gets. So if you have a company that already has a process and a workflow uh, to assign licenses to people and you want to point them there, then this is the feature that you're going to use for that. Um, and to show all this cool stuff in action, I'm going to call back uh, Ryan, who's going to demo it. <laughs> And so, where we'll start a demo is in the Microsoft 365 Admin Center. And we're within uh, Billing and then Licenses, and then within the Auto Claim Policy tab. And so here you can see my Power Platform Auto Claim Policy. It's currently enabled, and if I don't want it, it's as simple as that. Okay. Um, now the other thing is, as Zohar showed us earlier, users can also request licenses as well. And so all of those license requests appear here within the Microsoft 365 Admin Center. And so here we can see we've had a number of license requests, both from me as well as from the other Ryan and the Power Platform team, to make sure that these uh, all of these users have uh, have licenses. So just a quick little demo there. And so if we could move back to our presentation, please. Of course, all these capabilities you can use today, they are live in production. And once again, we encourage you to do so because we know that you have more valuable things to do with your time than to simply assign and unassign licenses every day. Now, we want to move to the next phase. How do we enable people to build apps well and then build apps in a way that flows naturally to production? And so, First of all, how many of you have had someone start to build an app? That app goes really big. You want to move it perhaps from like default or you know some environment to a production environment. And that's a challenge. Maybe it's not in a solution or something like that, right? And it's it's not exactly fun to try to take that app and, and extract it and put it into a solution. And so what we've done is we've introduced a capability called Preferred Solution. What Preferred Solution does is it defaults every single customization within the environment into that solution so that you start from a place of healthy application lifecycle management. Additionally, as we talked about earlier, we have capabilities like sharing limits to help you control how broadly apps are shared so that you don't have to contend with shadow IT or shadow production. Now the thing is, when people hit those sharing limits, you don't want that to become a cliff in their experience. And so what we have done is we've introduced the notion of pipeline on-ramps such that in the sharing experiences, we also provide people with ways to submit their applications to be deployed to production environments. Now this uses our pipelines set of functionality so that it's very, very easy for people to submit these applications to be deployed to other environments without needing to become continuous integration and continuous deployment experts. In addition, with AI and by empowering more makers, you're going to have more applications than ever that are being built and deployed within your organization. And the thing is, we thought, wait a second, and let's get a show of hands. How many of you have approved a deployment before without knowing what was in it? Oh, okay, and for those of you that didn't raise your hands, that means one of two things. Either you don't approve deployments, period, or you're lying, okay? so. <laughs> 
<laughs> and so one of the things we thought about is how can we bring the power of all these co-pilots that we're talking about and help you better understand what changes are occurring to applications within your environment. And so what we have done is we've introduced this capability called deployment nodes. What we do is we look at what assets live within a deployment and we generate deployment notes for you so that everyone downstream actually knows what's in that deployment. Now to be clear, if someone does manually specify a deployment note, we are not going to override those, right? It is a co-pilot, not a pilot. We believe strongly in keeping a human in the loop, but we think this is a very, very powerful tool because we've all seen a commit message or a deployment note in the past that was like, yeah, fixes because it's Friday afternoon and I want to go to the bar, right? Uh, similarly, we see that there's a great opportunity around application descriptions as well, where we also use co-pilots to generate app descriptions so that one, you know what a given app does, but two, so that you can help all the users through your organization who've been uh, had that app shared with them can also understand what those apps do as well. And so to show you what this looks like as a part of an end-to-end, -end, uh, we'll go over to my demo machine. And so here I've been placed in the Maker portal. And so here, remember how we talked about Maker onboarding earlier and how Zohar showed us how that can be configured? Here, Woodgrove has configured Maker onboarding to me so that I am instructed on how I should use um, use Power Platform and get started with a large number of links as well. Now I'm gonna close that and then what I'm going to do is I'm gonna go into my settings. And so within my settings, I'm just going to show you that in this case, my administrator has set a preferred solution for me. So that as I go through and as I start building my app, all of those customizations are going to be placed within this preferred solution without anyone else needing to do anything. Now from here, I'm going to take you to my amazing retrospectives app. Maybe this will be a retrospective app where we can triage you know, my bad jokes that I've been telling all session. Um, and so I love this app. I think this is going to change the world at my company. And so I'm gonna start by sharing it, okay? And so I'm gonna go over here. No co-pilot, not yet. And so I'm gonna start sharing my app. And I tell you what, I'm gonna start by sharing this with Hongfei, okay? And so as I share with Hongfei, as you remember earlier, Zohar set a sharing limit. And so you can see that sharing limit has prevented me from sharing this app more broadly, once again, containing the risk that this particular app could create within your organization. But we also don't want that to be a brick wall or a cliff as well. And so here you can see our pipeline on ramps, which prompts me to deploy this application to a new environment. And so I'm now going to start that. And so here, what's happening is it is telling me, hey, I can take this particular app that I built and I can push it to either my testing environment or my production environment. I have to tell you, it's late on a Friday, so I'm, I'm feeling a little dangerous. Um, and so I tell you what, let, let's go ahead and submit this directly to uh, production. And just for good measure, let's deploy it right now in the middle of the session, because what could possibly go wrong Okay, now the thing is along those lines of what could possibly go wrong, we wanna make sure that this app is good and healthy and all of these things. And so what we do is we actually validate the app. And in some cases with our managed environment settings where you can enforce solution checker, this also helps us make sure that the application follows the rules and guidelines that are enforced by solution checker. You can also configure that just to warn in case you wanna know what's up and what's going on. Now in this case, Another challenge that you may have seen when you're deploying apps across your environments is how do you get all your connections wired up correctly? And so in this case, we take care of that for you. We identify that. And so I'm going to go ahead and tell it to go. Now, within this experience right here, and I already had some deployment notes, I'm gonna clear those and I'm gonna create those notes. And so here what we're doing is we use the co-pilot to generate deployment notes for what's in this particular set of changes. Once again, so that when I submit this for deployment, my administrator actually knows what's in this particular deployment. And so I will click deploy. And so that's now going to submit this application to my admin. And so we're gonna watch here for a second. 
It is not there, it is over here. And hopefully any moment we will see a notification for my approval to come through. Now one of the other interesting things about what's going on is within pipelines we've also recently introduced the capabilities to deploy via service principles. Okay, and so what this allows you to do is ensure that no users, either your makers or your admins, ah, um, neither your makers nor your admins, um, need to have standing access to your production environment. And so I'm just gonna refresh, give me one moment. There we go, that's the request that I want. And so here we can see, hey, look, there are all my deployment notes, and so I can now turn around and approve this application to go to production. And so once again, that's going to be deployed using that service principle so that I do not have to have standing access to production. If we could go back to the deck, please. And so you can try this today, okay? Everything from preferred solution to pipeline on-ramps to our co-pilot generated descriptions, please go home, give it a whirl, or maybe even try it on the plane before you go home. Now, We've been talking Copilot so much this week. A common question that we have is, what about governing Copilot? And I'll say sometimes this is a bit of a challenging conversation because many of the controls that I, we hear customers asking for are actually intrinsic to how Copilot works. One, Copilot is built on Microsoft's approach to security, compliance, and privacy. Just because we use AI does not mean that those things change. The second thing, your data remains within the Microsoft cloud. It's not leaving our data center boundaries and going over to open AI or what have you. We leverage your existing user permissions and DLP policies, meaning if a user can't access a piece of data today, they're not going to be able to access it when they start using a Copilot. We do not train our models using customer data. None of our Microsoft employees have eyes on access to your data. We follow a broad set of responsible AI practices to ensure there is not bias within um, our models and the way that they are used. And we validate through red teaming and adversarial testing to build our confidence and your confidence in our co-pilots. Now on top of this, we also provide you with a broad set of configuration capabilities so that you can govern how Power Platform's co-pilots are used within your low-code estate. And so we have a broad set of these that you can try and that you can learn more about uh, as soon as you go home. Or once again, on the plane. The final thing is we want to go into our, our last stanza of the day, where we dig into how you can trust but verify. And to do this, I'd like to hand things back to Zohar, who will walk us through our purview in Sentinel integrations. All right, thank you. So, man, so many things for you that are new that we're announcing this uh, conference. I might be biased, but I think Power Platform is one of the coolest things since uh, sliced bread. And it's the best place for you to build applications. We've showed how trusted it is and all the trust and security capabilities. We've showed how we're shifting to a new environment strategy approach. And we've showed the entire circle about uh, how you can now get your makers to a personal environment and then have them develop and independently get creative with Dataverse and Copilot and all the rich set of capabilities and unblock a lot of creativity in your organization and allow yourselves to move much faster than before. And then last is, we really showed how you can govern it from an IT perspective, inject yourself to certify applications before they go broader. Um, it's not just the COE toolkit. There's a lot of richness you get once you have Power Platform licenses and you could start using the Power Platform as it is intended with its full governance. And the last thing I wanna show is uh, things we touched on earlier, which is the integration with Purview, the integration with uh, Sentinel, and then another last surprise at the end of what we're doing in the Power Platform Admin Center to inform you that now in a world where citizen developers are building a lot of assets, start imagining it's just like files. People are introducing these automations and apps and chatbots and things inside your platform. You wanna be able to govern it and rule and get visibility to where you need to pay your attention the most to. So the first thing I'm gonna show is Purview. Microsoft Purview is a great tool to automatically scan data stores, and it does that today with a rich set of data stores. We are pleased to announce in public review the new data store, which is Dataverse. So how many of you show of hands are interested to know what are your citizen developers 
storing and everything they're building, specifically sensitivity data. So Purview is exactly for that. It allows you to connect to the dataverses or the environments that you have in the PAP platform, scan them for today 200 plus different classifications like social security, credit cards, um, and then being able to then get some kind of a heat map on where do you really need to pay attention to, what environments. And for that, I'm just going to use a screenshot that shows I've scanned the environment that Ryan and I have been playing through the demo. We've uh, put some Easter eggs of social security uh, entries inside some of the tables, and then Purview was able to scan our environment and then just detect what are the tables inside the dataverses and the environments. And now I could take that list and I could go to the owners of the environment or owners of the application and just make sure that either they do the right thing or I'll force them with sharing limits to uh, prevent oversharing of sensitive data uh, using security groups and other means. In the future, we're going to continue to invest in making it much easier to automate and actually do uh, interactions automatically of blocking things and making sure that data doesn't get overexposed. The second thing I want to show is the integration with Sentinel. So earlier I asked about uh, Sentinel and many hands went up. Um, in the Sentinel, how many of you had this experience that I had lately where uh, you're off on vacation, you're in some remote uh, location, and then you're trying to use your credit card and the credit card is blocked because the credit card company has discovered that uh, something uh, fishy is happening and they're protecting you. Sentinel is kind of like that for Power Platform and in fact for many of the Microsoft services. Uh, and now we're integrating with Sentinel uh, into a rich set of Power Platform connectors including the audit logs from Power Apps, Power Automate, Dataverse, administration activities that are happening in the admin center. Um, the beauty of Sentinel is that it scans all these logs including the logs that come from Azure Entra and from your network uh, network devices and then it's able to then do correlation across them and look for a specific pattern and give you alerts if it identified uh, misbehavior or anything fishy, just like the credit cards companies do. So in this case, uh, we are already introducing a set of uh, rules or scanning um, specific templates that it's looking for. Examples are uh, Sentinel in, is informed of suspicious URLs. So if someone is building an application for phishing reasons and is embedding URLs, fishy URLs inside the application, Sentinel will tell you what the application is and you could uh, go after the owner of that app or turn it off and quarantine it. Other things is if there's a massive deletion of applications going on on the PAP platform, immediately after some user has left the organization, this is things that Sentinel can actually do for you. And for that, let me switch to the demo machine and show you. So here I am in the demo machine and I'm in the Sentinel tool. So I'm gone in, into the uh, specific portal of Sentinel. And you can see the integration with the PAP platform. One is uh, it's digesting data in real time and it's showing me the data the digestion of the logs from uh, PAP platform. And then it also informs me about specific incidents. These are the connectors that we've introduced. So these are new connectors in Sentinel that actually now integrate with the PAP platform. And you can get details of all these different connectors. And these are the specific Sentinel uh, pattern matches that it's looking for in Power Platform, and I'm highlighting one that I'm going to demo, which is uh, looking for uh, malicious behavior related to uh, specific malicious URLs that are in, a, in an application. So I go into the incidents, and I look at the log of incidents that Sentinel has discovered, and then there's this one highly classified incident, and I get information about the incidents, and I can actually uh, get the information that there's an app that is using a, a URL that seems to be malicious or in the malicious list. It's a really simple URL. It's called uh, malicious link. <laughs> <laughs> and I could see who built that application. So I get information about uh, Lee, who built this application. It's sitting in a specific environment. So it's called Contoso Bank. And then I know uh, the environment uh, name, and I know the app name. So I can now uh, contact that person. I also have information that there's a few users like Adele and Lynn that have already been uh, trapped in this application, so I could go and do some uh, damage control. Back to the PowerPoint. So 
If you want to learn more about the integration with Sentinel, this is the link that you could use to learn more about the Sentinel integration. And then the last thing that I want to show you is the work that we're doing in the, I'll let Ryan show you, the, the work we're doing in the Power Platform Admin Center uh, to empower you with more visibility. Thank you so much. And so as we've talked about earlier, you have more apps being created than ever. But the thing is, this creates certain operational risks, things like ownerless apps, things like apps that are unused and need to be cleaned up, or apps that are not in solution so that you can't leverage ALM, or highly active apps that are perhaps overshared with your organization. And so what we have done is we have built Power Platform Advisor to help you quickly identify these operational risks so that you can mitigate them. We do this also deeply integrated with the collaborative tools that you use today, such as Microsoft Teams, and we also are happy to announce not only the public preview of Power Platform Advisor here at Ignite, but also how we are integrating this deeply with Power Automate so that you can scale and automate remediation of these operational risks. And so I would like to quickly show you what this looks like. That is not, oh, let's try. Okay, beautiful. So here I am in the Power Platform Admin Center. Here we can see that I have four recommendations around ownerless apps, um, apps that have not been used, or other risks that exist. Here, if I go to apps in the tenant that don't have valid owners, or maybe I'll go to apps that haven't been used in the last few days, here I can go through and I can either select an app and quarantine it. I like to call this the screen test to see who screams when I turn it off. Um, or I can go through and delete that app as well. In addition, because I love the Retrospectives app so much, um, and I guess it's never been used, I could also say, you know, hey, since Hong Fei didn't use it, I'll ask her, say, hey, you know, should we clean this up? And then this will send a message to her and team so that she can then take action, along with this action card right below. Additionally, in some of these recommendations, we also have somewhat intelligent ways to go through and remediate these issues. And so in the case of these ownerless apps right here, I can select my groups app, and in this case, a lot of times you remediate ownerless apps by promoting a co-owner to owner. And so what this will do is this will, in the context of my experience, pull all of the co-owners for this particular app, at which point I can reassign. The final thing is we realize, I've worked with one of our customers on ownerless apps. They had 7,766 ownerless apps within their organization. Okay, the thing is they cannot go through that previous experience and click that 7,776 times. And so what we have done is we have integrated this with Power Automate so that you can use the Power Platform ad Admin Connector, which also enters public preview this week, to retrieve all of those ownerless apps, at which point you can can iterate through each app and then notify uh, those the app co-owners to say, hey, it's time to step up, or maybe you'll turn around and quarantine that app, okay? So if we can go back to our slides, Power Platform Advisor is entering public preview at Ignite. You can try it on your plane on the way home today. Assuming you flew, if you drove, please don't. Um, you know, that wouldn't be too good. And so with that, we've taken you on a journey today from how you can establish a security baseline to how you can enable govern innovation to how you can deliver continuous integration and then finally trust but verify. Our hope is as much as we all love puppies that you will be able to continue your journey and transitioning from power apps as puppies to power apps as sheep. And we have a broad set of resources that you can take a look at and try um, that cover the things that we've talked about today. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for joining us at Ignite. Take care.